Heading north, Sarah caught sight of the famous Eiffel Tower and began narrowing in on the city of Paris. The smell of cheese and snails wafted heavily on the air, and Sarah appeared to take comfort as the indigenous scent of Paris mimicked her own body odor. She gravitated toward the nearest restaurants. Waves of screams and sprinting feet began filling the streets as Sarah poked her head inside the buildings, beginning to empty the kitchens of their contents without discretion, devouring even the waiters and chefs in the process. Suddenly, gunshots were fired as Muslim extremists charged into battle against Sarah's ravenous wrath. These Muslims, who later turned themselves into us and confided their story, admitted they had planned a terrorist attack on Paris that day. However, when chaos unraveled and these Muslims laid eyes upon Sarah, they immediately changed their tune. If it's one thing all religions can agree on, it's that fat women must be stopped, they said. These Muslims began bravely defending the city of Paris against Sarah Avery, who, while not injured by their bullets, was so agitated, she flung herself away from the restaurants and fled the country of France entirely. The Muslims high-fived. Sarah ran for miles through Europe before stopping to catch her breath, slapping her hands on her knees as she heaved. Like a dog shaking off a wet coat, she shook her body to rid herself of the Niger men still inside her, flinging Nigers like droplets of water. Relieved but exhausted, she trudged on weakly before collapsing into a sobbing heap on her knees. She had made it to the country of Hungary. To our own relief, Sarah eventually passed out from her exhaustion. We contacted Hungarian authorities and convinced them to detain her and ship her overseas back to the United States. Sarah was still unconscious when she arrived back on California soil. Our next step would be a doozy. We had to somehow return her to quarantine, and the only direct route was back through San Francisco. This became a problem when our objective conflicted with a previously scheduled pride parade that would be taking place citywide. That meant that most of the streets were blocked off for the parade and a massive crowd was building. We only had so much time to make it back to quarantine before Sarah woke up and the clock was ticking. Rainbow flags soared high and sparkling confetti dazzled through the air, but disaster loomed. Oh, Sarah, what are we to do with you? I spoke aloud. That was when I suddenly received an ingenious idea that looking back on, I feel, was divinely inspired. With Sarah Avery loaded up on the back of our military convoy and covered by a sheet, I turned to our men. Get behind me, I said, and motioned for the men to follow as I approached a pair of city police guarding the entrance to one of the sectioned-off streets. I explained to the officers that we were part of the pride parade and had a float coming through. Surprisingly, they needed no further explanation. The younger of the two officers who I noticed spoke with a lisp, asked what the theme for our float was. I had to think on my feet. We're here with the body acceptance movement. On behalf of lesbian feminists, I replied, our float celebrates health at every size. The young officer giggled and flapped his hang at me, gently batting my chest. Oh, stop it, he lisped playfully and motioned us through. You boys have fun. And so, my dear, that is how your husband wound up at his first pride parade. And I have to say, we were a hit. The men and I removed the sheet covering Sarah Avery. The men and I removed the sheet covering Sarah Avery and moved slowly onward through the crowd, waves of cheers and explosions of confetti rousing alongside of us in uproarious tidal waves. Lesbian women in, part in particular adored our float some of them reaching out to stroke Sarah with excitement. I found myself a bit touched when I noticed feminists in the crowd shedding tears and covering their hearts for the first time in their lives, feeling reassured about their own bodies. All the attention made me nervous, especially with our sleeping monster in tow. But Sarah never woke, and we managed to make it safely through San Francisco and with a quite unexpected celebration party at that. So here I am, catching you up on our latest adventures, brushing sparkling rainbow confetti out of my hair. The Jesuits can certainly never say any of us are homophobic. Sarah Avery is safely back in quarantine, sleeping. And after all of this excitement, I feel that I will soon need to sleep myself. 
I adore you, my beloved King David woman, and I am so happy you are safe and well. Your husband, Brent Spiner. And Terrence Jenkins then Skyped with me later, and he said that, um, that the Muslim terrorists were planning to attack Paris, but when they saw Sarah eating everything, they was all Durka, Durka, which is terrorist talk. And we found out it meant that the only thing they hate more than freedom was fat women. So they attacked Sarah and saved Paris instead. And that's why only 129 people died. The Jesuit News is trying to keep people from knowing what happened and, and then what happened at the New World Trade Center. You're not hearing about that anywhere in the Jesuit News. That was horrible. Just absolutely. Tarant said it was the most horrible thing he ever saw. Um, and he said, that's why my news is so important that I need to make this video. And um, I asked about how many people did Sarah kill when she went on, you know, on her crusade through the world looking for food. And he said it was in the millions. And they don't really have a number. Um, and all of this tromping started, she was in San Francisco when she first escaped out of quarantine. And then she escaped uh, about a few days after Halloween. She ate all the food in the city. And we thought they thought she would stay in the restaurant areas. And then Halloween had candy, and that was, turned out to be really bad timing. She was attracted to the residential area. She, she ate everything. She's really big. Um, I asked if she's the size of a mountain. He said, no, but uh, she's pretty big. <laughs> and um, she has to be if she can float in the ocean. Anyways, so... Um, just wanted to, this is very important news. We, the good news is we've got her back in quarantine. And um, I asked, why are we keeping this cannibal alive? She, she's a literal cannibal. And, um, oh, and also let me explain spaghettification. If, there's, if you look at Wikipedia, S-P-A-G-H-E-T-T-I-F-I-C-A-T-I-O-N, they actually have a Wikipedia article about what that is, so you might want to check that out. Um, it, so at the at the World Trade Center, the people when they got sucked up into her vagina, they actually thinned and became like spaghetti noodles, and um, and that's from the gravitational tidal forces, because she's very condensed. Um, I asked why we're keeping this cannibal alive because she's already killed millions, and Tarant said there's a de debate with our scientists. A lot of them think that her body is keeping itself from collapsing under her gravity. And some of the scientists think if her respiratory system stops, she'll just compress and suck into a black hole. So that's why they don't want to just execute her. If they restrain her and don't let her move, that might make it worse too. Because fat girls always get fatter once they stop moving. And then if she gets too fat, she can actually become a black hole. Um, her vagina could become a black hole. And um, that's that would be bad. Um, cause, um, so anyways... They've been trying to make her lose weight, and then she escaped from the compound when all this horrible stuff happened. And um, so that's that's been the main news in the past couple months. All the other stuff. Oh, by the way, I asked Terrence, what's all this stuff we're hearing about plane crashes and t terrorist attacks? He said that's all Jesuits stuff that they're making up and they report one version of the news to Florida, another version to Washington, another version so they're, the Jesuits are sending out false news reports fabricating stories from what I hear there's not even Vladimir's not even attacking Syria I mean they're, they're making all this stuff up so um, basically what you're hearing in this video is the main news everything else you're hearing on the news is all Jesuit stuff made up um, Jesuit fabrications um, I right, so you just can't. The only news that's reliable is the Gabriel Chana Fox News Channel. Zero, zero on your cable dial, okay? That's the only news that's reliable. Everything else is a bunch of Jesuit lies. They're just making up a whole bunch of stories. It's all, it's all lies. Every, everything but the Gabriel Chana Fox News Channel is full of lies. They're making up stories. They're creating catastrophes. They could, they could write a good thriller novel. They ought to just say that what you're hearing on the news is a big thriller novel and, and admit that it's all fiction because that's basically what it is, okay? And what you're hearing in my video is the truth. Oh, I forgot to mention one thing. Um, it's really a tragedy that the Jesuits are trying to make out these Muslims to be the terrorists because they were actually the heroes. They uh, saved Paris from so that only 129 people died. They had a change of heart. They were planning on being terrorists. And they actually high-fived when they saved Paris, and they put a jihad on Sarah. 
but a few of them accidentally blew up though because they did a chest bump to, con to congratulate each other and it set off their suicide vests. So, okay, so that's her Sarah Avery's vagina ate the World Trade Center. So that's the real news, okay? So let's go ahead and get this out because it needs to go out.